they decided I was going to die. And they sent word to the next village, which it took a day to walk there, to tell them that dude died because they knew that by the time that they'd get back that I was going to be dead. I was in bed and I'd been laying there, hadn't spoke a word of English to anybody in five days. And I was sick unto death and I was going to die. All of a sudden, what I thought was one of those missionaries came into the room and he sat down on my bed. He put his hand on my forehead and he said, man, Troy, you are extremely sick. You've never been this sick in your whole life. And I said, no, I've never been this sick before. He says, I've got good news. And the good news is tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to feel a whole lot better. And the day after tomorrow, you're going to be strong enough to walk out of this place. Welcome to Along the Way. I'm John Matarazzi, your host and fellow traveler. Thank you for joining me along my way as I try to become more like Jesus every day. My conversation with Troy Brewer in this episode was so much fun. Troy and I talked about the powerful ministry that he leads, and he shares some really amazing stories from his journey with Christ. He's the pastor of Open Door Church in Burleson, Texas, has radio and TV programs, and rescues girls and boys from sex trafficking around the world. You'll hear how he started doing that in our conversation. He is the author of the book, Redeeming Your Timeline, and you are going to hear how Jesus really does step into our timeline and redeems it. If you want to know how Jesus can really redeem your timeline, then you are going to enjoy my conversation with Troy. I'll get to that in just a moment, but as always, I want to thank you for listening to Along the Way. I hope that you like what you hear and you subscribe. You can connect with me online as well. All of my socials and contact links are in the show notes, and you can check out all of my episodes at my website, alongtheway.media. Join my email list and find out more about me too. I hope that you check it out and you connect with me. I would love to hear from you. I also have a Patreon page if you would like to help me to continue to put out these Along the Way episodes. If you'd like to become a Patreon, simply go to patreon.com slash along the way and select a level. The link to become a Patreon supporter is in my show notes. And now, here's my Along the Way conversation with Troy Brewer. Well, Troy Brewer, thank you so much for allowing me to join you just for this brief period of time. And uh, actually, we're going to be talking quite a bit about time in this episode and how God has redeemed your time, redeemed time um, in your past, present, and future. But one of the things that I always like to do is I want to hear about your story. Before we go into some of the questions that I have planned, I want to hear what's on your heart about how God has led you along your journey. So this is an opportunity to share your testimony, how God has led you to where you are today. So I'd just love to hear what you have to offer about that. Well, I want to tell you, John, God's done a crazy thing with me. I don't know that I can even explain or define <laughs> how yeah. God has done what he's done with me. And uh, other than just to say, I, I, I grew up in rural Johnson County, Texas, grew up in a town called Joshua and uh, lived there for 50 years, moved out on my 50th birthday to a little town called Glen Rose. But I've, I'm just saying I've lived in the same small area my entire life and uh, got radically saved in 1986. And I was 19 years old. I joined a Christian rock hair, uh, a Christian big haired rock, rock band. What and, was the name uh, of the group? Destiny. Destiny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's kind of cool, isn't it? And I actually had a song called, called Redeeming Time, which is funny. Hmm. I, I wrote a song called Redeeming Time, but... But uh, got saved, got filled with the Holy Spirit, started living this radical walk for King Jesus, uh, played in a Christian rock band, started playing all over the place, uh, uh, did music from 86 until about 90, 91, and, wow. uh, but around, played on lots of albums, all kinds of fun stuff, opened up for all kinds of people all over the world, great, great, great stuff. And then um, my wife and I started feeding people. We fell in love with feeding people, and we built a food bank in 1990, and um it blew up and turned into something huge. And um, that ended up turning into a church, which I reluctantly stepped into the church saying, I thought, oh, man, we're, it's going to mess everything up, man, if we start doing church, man, I don't want to do that. And you know, we've been <laughs> planning churches all over the world. And I was like, <laughs> I, was like I want to do something else other than that. But we did it. And now uh, 25 years later, that's actually 30 years later from the food bank and mm. 25 years later from Open Door Church. Um, yeah, we have uh, we save girls out of sexual trafficking all over the world. We save wow. over a thousand girls a year. We saved one thousand one hundred sixteen girls last year, wow. and, and and boys. And we have orphanages all over the world. We have a food bank that feeds one hundred fifty thousand people. All that, but I'm just saying that the Lord, the Lord just took something very 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 small, and He did something crazy cool. And uh, it's your whole gig, man. I didn't know. You know, I call that Jehovah sneaky when <laughs> when, when the Lord is doing something in your life and you don't know it's Him. 
Right. And he couldn't tell you because it would freak you out. You know, oh, he, yeah. he would totally, you know, blow your mind. And uh, the Lord didn't tell me. He didn't tell me what all he was doing. But he did. Uh, 25 years ago, I was in Israel. And while I was in Israel, I ran into a very world famous, if I told you who it was, you know who it is, prophetic guy. He just walked straight up to Leanna and I. Hmm. And we were poor as dirt. We only had $200 in our pocket. We had tickets given to us to go there. And we just thought, well, we'll just eat at the hotel. They have breakfast and, you know, we'll do the poor people thing. We'll just load up in boxes and that's what we'll eat and it'll be fine. And this world famous, very world famous prophetic guy walked straight up to me and he said, do you know that you have a Joshua anointing? And I said, well, I'm from Joshua, Texas. And he got real dramatic. So he says he's from Joshua, Texas. You know, he started freaking <laughs> entourage started clapping, you know? And then uh, he said, look, I want to sow into your ministry and I want to bless you. I want to put you in a suite. I want to pay for everything that you do while you're here in Israel. He didn't know we didn't have any money. We went through that money at all. Wow. And he paid for absolutely everything. And then he prophesied to me and he told me, he said, Troy, God's going to do an amazing work with you. He's going to give you a worldwide television ministry. He's going to give you books. He goes, you have many, many books within you. You're going to have a worldwide radio ministry and your books are going to be required reading in theological seminaries. And you're going to be invited to do all this stuff. You will literally be before Kings. Hmm. And he said, but none of it will happen until after you're 50. And I, I was in my twenties then. Okay. That's not a fun word to get dude. When you're in your twenties. No, especially when you're in your twenties, man, and, that's, that's uh, tough. But that's Nobody exactly wants what, to wait. <laughs> Nobody wants to wait for exactly anything right. like that. No, no, of course not. That's exactly what happened. He nailed it. And uh, I, I talked to John Paul Jackson. He told me that his show was the first show I was on. John Paul told me that he had Bob Jones prophesied to him the same exact thing. Hmm. He said, you're going to do great, great, great things, blah, blah, blah. But it won't happen until after you're 50. I turned 50 in 2016. My church blew up into the thousands. I mean, we, wow. we, we went from a church of... For more than 16 years, we had less than 200 people in our church, and it you know, blew up into thousands and thousands. And my book became required reading in theological seminaries all over the world. Which book is that? It's a book called Numbers That Preach. Numbers That Preach. It's on prophetic numbers and what biblical numbers represent. And uh, yeah, and so all that happened. And so my journey has just been... Uh, for 30 years, it was in a very quiet place, just feeding people and building orphanages and uh, doing the food bank and running a very tiny church. Hmm. And uh, in the midst of all that, I learned the goodness of God and I learned that good truly does overcome evil. And that's what my whole world is about is walking with Jesus in the goodness of God. Yeah, I definitely think that that is probably the best place to learn the goodness of God because you see the goodness of God in the small things and then he's able to show you the, the goodness of God in the bigger things. You know, it's the whole principle of being faithful with little, he'll make you ruler over much. Yes. And it's so true because God, he wants us to be good stewards of the things that he's given us, whether it be money, finances, property, experiences, you know, the people that he's brought into our lives. And as we're faithful with that, he does bring up a lot more, which is really, really cool how God can take where we are, but we, he doesn't leave us there. He wants to bring us to a, a destination, to a place where he has the ultimate goal in mind because he does see the end from the beginning and he's not confined within our own time frame. And yes, I'm, gonna t I'm, I'm teasing this whole thing Come because on, we are going to talk about the most interesting topic, uh, I think, that I might be having on this show is literally time travel. And uh, we want to talk about that in a little bit, but you said something that I want to just kind of hone in on right now. You said that you rescue girls and boys too from sex trafficking. I can't let you just gloss over that. I want to hear about how God birthed this ministry in your heart, because that's not something that your average person's able to do. Well, all the big church that we do, brother, is to do big ministry. That's what mm -hmm. it's for. And so, yeah, so... Years ago, we started because because the food bank uh, blew up, John, we not only did we have an opportunity to feed people locally, but then I started finding ways to take food into other countries. And hmm. we would go into other countries and my wife and I would do this and we would go and uh, we started doing incredible things. And then in, I want to say, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, sometime in there, I was in Costa Rica and we were in the trash dump in San Jose, Costa Rica. And we were doing a tremendous work there. And a lady brought me two little Nicaraguan refugee children, 10-ish, um, 10 years old, and, and offered to sell me these two little girls. And she thought I was a sexual tourist because I was a middle-aged white guy. 
Mm-hmm. Middle-aged white guys are going all over the world molesting these children as sexual tourists. Oh, and so God. she assumed that that's what I was, since I was an American and that's what I was there for. And I said, I looked at these kids and when I understood what she wanted, I was like, you want to sell me these girls? And she said, yeah. And she goes, and she said, you can make a movie. Oh, that's disgusting. And I saw these kids. I saw who they were and I saw how beat up they were and I saw how starving they were. And I knew that Jesus had brought me these kids. And that's a, that's a big thing with me, John. Mm. I don't go looking for ministry anywhere. I just pay attention to what Jesus brings me. That's good. And and I just have that's a really yes good. to my spirit for what the Lord brings me. So I said, yeah, I'll buy them right now on the spot. And I literally paid money for those two little girls and left with them, called my friends. who We had an orphanage there, went to the orphanage, and I told them in the car. And uh, I said, girls, y'all are going to remember this day for the rest of your life. And uh, told him, I said, you don't, you don't know me, but Jesus knows you and he loves you so much, man, that he sent me from Texas to come down here and to rescue you. And I'm going to take care of you. Wow. So we took them there, fed them, uh, you know, took care of them. And after that, I started noticing every single time that I was in a trash dump, I could spot those kids. Mm. And so we did that for years and years and years randomly. And then a few years ago, we started doing that strategically. And actually, in 2016 is when we started doing that strategically. And we do a work in Nepal. We do a huge work in Nepal. We do a work mm. in uh, India, in Uganda, in Mexico, in Belize, in Colombia, and in uh, Southeast Asia, all over Southeast Asia. Wow. And yeah, and we have friends. I, we have networks. We have a huge network now. And we are, we're saving more than 1,000 kids out of sexual trafficking every single year now. Wow. Wow. Yep. And that's just started because you said yes to what Jesus brought in front of you. That's beautiful. I didn't know what else to do. We actually saved seven kids. We, we rescued seven kids last Friday, five little boys and two little girls. And uh, yeah. little girls were both nine-year-olds, and mm. they've been missing since July of 2019. Oh, my gosh. And we found them. We found these children and literally rescued those children. That was a big breakthrough we had just on Friday. Oh, my gosh. So we're all celebrating that. We got these kids now. But, but now we're going to have to take care of them for forever because, I, you know, and I don't care. So we have thousands and thousands of kids in our system that we're raising all over the world that we've rescued over the, wow. over the past 20 years. So it's crazy. It's a crazy work, man. It's crazy. Wow. I, I don't think I'll ever forget the first time that I was on a mission trip in another country where I had a little girl, probably around that same age, nine, maybe there was, there was two of them actually. They came up to me offering themselves Mm -hmm. and it was a disgusting thing. And I did not know how to, I was totally in shock. Obviously I didn't do anything. I, you know, I I left that right away, but I was like, I don't know what to do. I mean, I was in my early twenties at that time, but I am so grateful that you just have this, this mentality already built inside of you that you're just going to say yes to whatever Jesus brings to you. And you took that and you redeemed it. And what somebody meant for evil, God turned it around and used it for good. I mean, you, you'd like to say that it'd be great if that woman didn't do that, but because she did that and you redeemed that situation, yeah. God used that to open up so much of this amazing ministry that you have now. Wow. Thanks, man. That's really cool. You know, you know what, John, in, in, in right context or rather in right relationship with the father, the father brings you things. That's what he did to yeah. Adam right? Mm. He said, what do you want to do with this? What do you want to do with that? Adam didn't have to go out looking for the animals, you know, all the things that he had dominion over. The Lord brought him the things that he would name and he would have dominion over. And I think that a big part of that principle has been lost. And I don't want to lose that. We are so busy involved in so many things. I never want to look to do another ministry again, Mm. but the Lord brings me things daily and says, Troy, what do you want to do with this? And I'm always looking for those things. That's how you search for the kingdom. And since I'm a kingdom searcher, I know that I, I wake up every morning and I say, thank you, King Jesus, for all the good things that you're going to bring me today that I don't have a clue about. Yeah. And I'm looking for him to do that. Wow. It's cool. That's really cool. You know, I think in our, in our human state, we have a, a natural desire to go out and find things. We want to explore mm-hmm. and we just miss the things that God does bring to us. And yeah. what you're saying right there is challenging me uh, right now because, you know, there's things that God has brought into my life that maybe I'm overlooking because I am looking for that big thing down the road, but God brings this this thing into my life that is, it might look small at the moment, but it could open up what God really does have for me. Yes, sir. And there's been a lot of times in my life where I'm grateful that I have noticed those things, but I know there's plenty of times where I've missed that boat for sure. <laughs> 
you know, we've been talking about redeeming and that seems to be a, a huge thing in your life and your book redeeming your timeline. I've seen a couple interviews. I've heard a, a bit about this and I absolutely love this concept. What God has showed you about this. I have a lot of questions, so I want to give you the opportunity to kind of explain how God showed this to you and what redeeming your timeline actually means. So, yeah, let me hear about that. Okay. Well, I told you I played in a Christian rock band, right? Yes. So, so we were playing. There's this, there's this really cool place in Texas. It's called Sixth Street. And it's a place that needs to be redeemed, I promise you. Amen. <laughs> and it's in, it is in Austin. And we were playing down there at a place called the Liberty Lunch. And we were playing all these secular clubs at that time as well. We had a we had a big time secular set, you know, and it was all it was all songs of redemption. But it was like, you know, without love, where would you be now? It was all those kinds of songs. But we had a full-blown secular set. Uh, so that we can play secular clubs and then bring people to Jesus. And we would actually, that was a big part of our ministry team. And uh, I looked behind the bar while I was up there jamming. I looked behind the bar at the Liberty Lunch and there on the wall was a sign in the midst of all this Texas stuff. You know, there's like horseshoes and there's plows and I don't know, crop duster stuff, you know, up there. And I see this sign that says, time is God's way from keeping everything from happening at once. And it just blew up. And I was mm-hmm. like, what the heck? And I'm out there, da, 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 da. and I'm like, what? And Johnny hit me. Why would God not want everything to happen at once? Hmm. And I couldn't get away from that thought. And it jumped in my, it jumped on my head the way the alien jumped on John Hurt back in 1980. I couldn't get it off of me. I was just like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with this? And it began this journey for me to go, okay, if God's going to put me in a timeline, and he has, I need to understand what time is. I need to know how time works. I need to know how God interacts with time. I need to know what is possible with time. I need to know what time is for. And whatever time that the Lord has trusted me with, I want his dream for my time to become true. Hmm. And so I started studying it. I started studying time, and I found out first right off the bat that that actual sign is a quote from Einstein that Einstein said, time is God's way from keeping everything from, from happening at once. And that moved me into a position of, of the premises of the book here. And the premise of the book is that God created time and he is not subject to it in any way whatsoever. And then the second premise of the book is that God created time for the purposes or the works of redemption. Hmm. And I have five premises in that, but that is, is what started the whole thing is where does time begin? I, it, the Lord began to show me, Troy, um, I created time. I, it's, it's employed by me and everything that is all the matter that is within space is also confined to time. So time, space, and matter are in perfect continuum. And as a matter of fact, the very first verse of the entire Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning time, God created the heavens, space, and the earth matter. Time, mm. space, and matter are in the very first verse of the Bible, yeah, which wasn't discovered until about 80 years ago, hmm. the, the continuum of time, space, and matter. Yet it's been in the Bible all this time in the very first verse. And so I started studying it, and that's been a lot of what my journey is. Okay, so I've been fascinating with time travel probably my entire life. I don't remember what the exact first thing was where I came, you know, I saw the concept of time travel, but I mean, you've got the Avengers just had a, their movie was all about that. And you had, gosh, you've got back to the future. You've got, there's so many movies. It's a great principle. It's a great concept. It's a great plot line for movies and stories and things like that. But we, as people have a tendency to say we are in a fixed position on a timeline and we're only moving in one direction and we can't do anything about what has happened in the past. But you have some interesting stories about that and actual proof that I want to hear about. So I want to kind of hear about that. I do have questions. So, all right. Okay. So, so let's just, let's just kind of look at, let's look at it biblically, first of all. Yeah. And are there any examples of time travel in the Bible? Are there any examples? Everybody like, of course not. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. There, there's actually lots of examples of time yeah. travel. But before, but before I get off into that, let me just say this. Can God change matter? Absolutely. Yeah, he can change water into wine. Yeah, he can change a leper's body into whole. Okay. All right. Well, can, can God change space? Can Philip go down into the water, come up out of the water, and then be found in azotose instantly? Mm-hmm. Okay. 
So if you can believe that God can change matter, and if you believe that God can change space, you have to believe that God can change time because time, space, and matter are inseparable, and they're actually all the same thing. If you're going to have matter, you have to have a space to put it in. And if you're going to have space, you have to have mm-hmm. time because it takes time to go from one space to another. Okay. Okay. That's the continuum. That means they're totally, you cannot separate time, space, and matter. You, you can't. So if, if you believe that God can change matter, and if you believe that God can, can, can change space, you, you have to make the leap and believe that God can change time. Then when it comes to actual, okay, give me an example of time travel. Just show me. Okay. Not only does Jesus time travel, but sometimes he takes people with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's an example of Jesus saying he time travels. Once you find him in the book of Matthew, you can actually find him way before the book of Matthew. Okay. You can actually find him all throughout the Old Testament. Right. Now we call those a Christophanies. A Theophanies is an appearance of God, but a Christophanies is an appearance of Jesus in the Bible that is precarnate, that is before he shows up in Bethlehem. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And there's examples of that. I think one of the greatest examples of that is Samson's mom and dad, man, brother Manoah, he sees Jesus and the Bible just calls him the angel of the Lord. And he tells him, he says, what's your name? He says, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. He says his name is wonderful. Hmm. Well, his name shall be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Right. And then furthermore, after that, he says, he says, well, let me create an altar and let me make a sacrifice. That's okay. Then the, the angel called Wonderful steps up in, onto the altar, becomes the sacrifice, and enters into heaven. And then Manoah falls down and says, we're going to die because we've seen the face of God. Yeah, he realized something happened there. <laughs> yeah, that was Jesus. Yeah. That was Jesus. And that's a lot like finding, you know, an iPhone in King Tut's tomb, or that's like finding Mm -hmm. a 747 300 years before, or 3,000 years before the Wright brothers ever took flight. Well, you can find it. Furthermore, you can also see Jesus traveling into the future. You can find that at the book of John. He tells Peter, I've seen your death day. Yeah. I know how your death is going to glorify me. Seen it. And it's going to glorify me, and it's a big deal. Okay, you remember that. But he wasn't talking to him on his death day. He was talking to him years and years and years, decades before his decade, telling him, I've seen it. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, in the book of Revelation, John is on the island of Patmos 2,000 years ago. Jesus shows up in chapter 4, calls him up out of the timeline, moves him 2,000 years into the future, shows him the rapture of the church and the return of King Jesus, the tribulation, and then pulls him up again out of time, moves him 1,000 years into the future. Now now he's traveled 3,000 years into the future, Mm -hmm. drops him to show him the great white throne judgment, shows him everything after time, whenever whenever time shall be no more, and then pulls him back up, takes him back 3,000 years, drops him down on an island and says, write it all down. <laughs> that's the Bible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's legit. And it's the Bible. Right. And we sometimes look at and think, oh, he just had a vision of that. But uh as you no. read it, there's exactly. there's more to it. That 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 was an experiential thing. It is not just a no. it's not just pictures in your brain that is that's happening for sure. No, it's not it wasn't pictures in his brain. He actually had an encounter. He actually went there. Yeah. He went there and he saw it. And they saw him. And there was no problem with that. So not only not only can Jesus move in and out of time however he wants to, but he can actually take people with him. But my whole thing, John, about all this is the first premise of understanding that God is not subject to time. That will change your life because it means you do not have to be shackled to the shame of your past or the fear of your future mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. That's a tremendous deal. And where I got this revelation from is it okay if I tell people about the train track incident? Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely, yeah. So I had an encounter with Jesus that was stupid. It was ridiculous. And I wasn't even looking for the Lord that day. In Joshua, Texas, we had this common experience of this this train goes by all the time, and you have to just sit there. And our trains are incredibly long in Texas because we have limited train space. We value private land and there's a million trains and dude, you got to, you just got to wait. And I was sitting at this train track going, Oh man, just shoot me because I'm always in a hurry. I'm a guy that's the next thing, next thing, next thing. I like to get stuff done, man. I love to, I love to accomplish stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching one train go by so slow. Here comes another. And I'm just sitting there going, Oh, this is miserable. And I look as far as I can see and I cannot see the engine any longer And I look as far as I can see this way, and I cannot see the caboose. And I'm just thinking, all I can see is one of these trains at a time. And this train is so long. Instantly, 
I had an encounter with the Lord. And I had exactly what you just described. I saw a picture in my mind, and I saw, I would say, maybe 10 minutes worth of real-time stuff that in real time only happened in a second or two. Mm. Okay? Boom. It happened just like that, and this is what happened. I I saw my truck, and I was, like, lifted above my truck maybe more than 1,000 feet, Oh, wow. And I could see my truck sitting, watching, looking at the train, seeing one segment of a car at a time. But I could look all the way down, and I could also see there's the engine. And I could look all the way down, and I could also see there's the caboose. And I instantly understood that God sees my entire timeline, the day I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I'm experiencing all at the same time. Mm. I instantly understood it. I understood it in a way that was very supernatural. And I was like, okay, I get it. I also understood in that moment that God sees the entire timeline of all human history at the same exact time because he's not subject to it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to sit and wait for a moment to go by. He is not subject to any moment. He is the ancient of days, which means he is older than time. Yeah. He actually has supremacy over time, right? He's the ancient of days. So I know, I, I know John, that at this moment, this very moment, God Almighty is watching this interview with you and I. Mm-hmm. He is also watching David Slay Goliath mm. right now. He's also watching the return of King Jesus right now. He's watching Abraham walk around in the blood covenant in that cool figure eight mm-hmm. uh, and make a blood covenant with him. He's watching Adam's fall right now. And he sees it all right now. He mm. sees it so much like that, that as soon as he sees the, the timeline and the foundation of it at the beginning— He goes, okay, I see it all. Here's what I need. Before this timeline, I need to put a purpose of redemption before time began. Mm. And I'm just going to just do that right there because I can see the entire timeline. And I can operate any in any way that I want to. I can step in at any time that I want to. And any time that Jesus is made manifest, he brings redemption. And redemption actually changes the flow of time from there forward or even from there past. Amen. Amen. You know, as you're talking and explaining about this vision that you had or this experience that you had where you're looking over the train and you can see, you know, all the way to the that what's coming and all the way for what is what is gone, uh, gone past. You know, I'm just reminded of the scripture that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. You know, his his the way that he sees things, the way that he experiences things is higher and that gives us that gives him a different perspective. And as you were talking about that, that verse just came to mind. And I'm like, wow, that really does, it's not just that God is, you know, thinking about that he knows, like he literally can see it all. He sure can. He can see it all at the same time. That's really interesting. So how does this, this concept then affect our lives? How it affects our life is that we have a huge responsibility as priests and as stewards of our lives. We have a tremendous responsibility to occupy the territory that God has given us. And I know that I know that you know that verse. And we have to bring redemption and we have to literally displace the enemy in the promised land that God has trusted us. And that includes everything within our life. It also includes our entire timeline. Mm. That's what it, it includes all of that. So it's through the power of displacement. You know, whenever you move into the promised land, he says, look, man, there's houses you didn't build, there's vineyards you didn't plant, there's wells you didn't dig. But you need to know this. There's giants there. There are walled cities, and there are 31 flavors of kings. There's 31 different kings in promised (laughs) land. And you're going to have to move in, and you're going to have to displace them. You move in, and you move them out. And that's the way that heaven invades our earth. That's That's the way that good overcomes evil. So you and I have a specific time frame, and if if we are responsible for inviting Jesus into our homes, our hearts, our heads, our marriages, our want life right now, we know that if if we understand that God is not confined to our now, we can also look at the times that need to be redeemed in our past and also within our future. I'm going to give you a future case first. Sure. I'm I'm not going to wait until I die to ask the Lord to be with me. Okay. I've already asked him and he's already there. And I've asked him to meet me there. How can I fear death knowing that Jesus is going to be with me and that the last few minutes of my life is going to be miraculous and awesome? (laughs) How can I be afraid knowing that God is with me? And that's the whole thing of do not fear, do not fear, do not fear, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I'm not waiting until that moment. As a matter of fact, I, I get up and I preach 
every single Sunday in front of thousands of people. And this is what I ask King Jesus, Lord, meet me on the stage. And my confidence is not in my sermon. My confidence is not in that the tech is going to go right. My confidence is not in that the people are going to receive it. My confidence is that I've already prayed and I've asked King Jesus to join me. Hey, Lord, tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning, can I feel your presence like never, ever, ever before? Can I invite you into that time place? If I had the right to invite him into my now, I had the right to invite him in. I also had the responsibility to invite him into that place. And he's not subject to time. He can step right into my tomorrow right now for me. And when I get there, boom, he's there. And I go, oh, there is the presence of sweet Jesus. I knew you'd be here. I'm so excited. So I prepared this message and I prepared my heart and I'm ready to rock and roll, man. Let's do this, God. It's going to be crazy cool, right? Hmm. Okay. If I can invite him into my future and I can, knowing that he's going to meet me there. I mean, how many times have you, brother, you, you had an important meeting or something. You said, Lord, this meeting has got to be, God, please meet me there. God, please, please be manifest in that. Show up, Lord God. Give me simple solutions to complicated issues, Lord God. Give me the language. Give me the right thought process. Okay, you're praying for a future event. And then you show up. He, he's not just showing up then. He already showed up then when you asked him a day before that. Because he's not subject to the timeline. He steps right in right then. And it changes your now, even though it's not going to happen until tomorrow, because deep calls into deep, and it causes you to have faith for that moment. It causes you to start partnering with him as you are getting closer and closer to your arrival to where he's at with you in that. Right. I know that sounds crazy, man, but I'm telling you, it's just so real. Right. Yeah. You, you said at the beginning, you, you're just saying yes to what Jesus brings you. Yes. So you're asking Jesus to go and prepare a way for you so that when you get there, he already knows what he's got to pull in to then present to you and to give you. Yeah. That's what he does. He says, he says, I go away to prepare a place for you yeah. and I will come again so that where I am, you may also be. Yep. That's all he does, dude. Wow. And we're clueless. And we're totally clueless. And I, I love this. I love this because the more we're talking, the more scripture is like popping into my brain. And I'm like, oh, there's, he's talking about. That. Yeah, there's he's another application. About, that. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That. There's another application of that. Okay. Well, here's another thing. Not only does that work concerning your future, and, and, and one of these days, brother, we're going to have to talk about different kinds of time because mm. there's all different kinds of time. Okay. There's like right now, just in the natural, you and I, we experience now time, but we also experience past time and future time differently. Well, time is relative. Right. Time is relative to a whole lot of things. It's relative to how fast you're going, how slow you're going. It's relative to mass. It's relative to gravity. It's relative to speed. It All kinds of things. But it's also relative to the presence of Jesus. Mm. Wow. It's totally relative to the presence of Jesus. And, and, and one of the things that I can tell you that I can tell you about this is time speeds up the closer we get to the return of Jesus. So the Bible, the Bible puts it this way. And in those days, the days shall be shortened for the elect's sake. Okay, everybody knows, dude, that our grandparents' day was longer than our day. We don't know how that works, but we know it. We know that a 24-hour day for our grandparents was longer than our day is. But a 24-hour day is still a 24-hour day, but somehow our time is faster. It's accelerated the closer we get to the return of King Jesus. Yeah, I've heard people explaining too, I'm sure you've heard this, but like when you're one year old, like that's the only frame of reference that you have of life. And then you're two, you've now lived, you know, one year is like half of your life. When you're 10, one year is just a tenth of your life. As you get older, that time increment just gets shorter and shorter. And so I've just kind of looked at it and said, you know, as I get older, time will speed up. But you're taking it even a step further and saying, as we're getting closer to the return of Jesus, time is speeding up even more. You're right, bro. It is actually accelerated. Now, you're, what you just said is absolutely true because time is relative to the lens that you view it by. Yeah. OK, time is relative to the lens. And that's and that's Einstein's theory of relativity is, OK, time is faster for a guy off outside of the train than it is for the guy who's viewing it inside the train, mm -hmm. because the speed of light is one hundred eighty six thousand miles per second. Right. OK, that's right. That's the speed of light. Boom. All right. And you cannot change it. It is unchangeable, but it's relative, which means if you're on a train that's doing 100 miles an hour, the, to the guy on side the train that's shining a flashlight. His lens 
says, okay, I'm measuring it. Boom. I just clocked it. It's 186,000 miles per second. But if you're standing outside the train and the train is going by hundred miles an hour and to you, it's 186,000 miles and 100 miles mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. or I should say per, per second. Yeah. And that's real. So definitely the lens is makes your time relative, but the flow of time itself, the fabric of time is something that actually flows and actually moves. And it is actually speeding up towards the return of Jesus because that's the whole purpose of time is redemption. That's kind of like when you're in the last car of a roller coaster. That's it. You got yep. it. You, you nailed get, it. You get pulled down faster. Yeah. You nailed it. That's perfect. I had never thought of that. Yeah, I'm going to steal that from you, by the You're way. welcome to it. You're yeah, welcome to it. People are going to think I'm a genius. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's, you know, as you're talking about this, that makes total sense. And I, I understand that, you know, we can kind of understand that time is, you know, we're moving in one direction. Today is, you know, recording this on Monday, January 25th. Tomorrow is going to be Tuesday, January 26th. We, we understand that concept because we can see it as on a calendar. We can say yesterday was January 24th, and these things happened. Those things are now set in stone. Right. But you have some interesting ways to, to look at that, how even though something has happened in our past, it is not necessarily set in stone in a couple in, in a few different ways. Could you explain that a little bit? And you have some great stories that are it's not just about saying, oh, I'm just thinking about this thing that happened in the past and God's giving me peace about it. Um, like this, this whole inner healing thing, which is really uh, important and, and valuable and letting God deal with those things. Of course. But you're, you're saying that there's even a step further than that. And I would like to unpack that a little bit. There's, there's a couple of stories that you've brought up that I heard that I, that I think would be, it would be great to share here. Well, okay. So the difference is between if the Lord is made manifest or not. Mm. So it's kind of like the difference between it's the, the, it, it, it works like this. Okay. Let's say you have a really, you have a, you have a wedding and you're really poor and you don't have any wine, but the spirit of the Lord shows up and he consoles you and he heals you and says, you know, it's not about your poverty. It's about your union and it's beautiful. And, you know, and, and that's wonderful. Then there's the difference between Jesus showing up and changing the water into wine. Mm -hmm. That's completely different. Now it's Jesus showing up both times, but one time he shows up and he does a work within you. But the other time he shows up and he transforms the entire scene. Mm -hmm. Those are two different kinds of ways that the Lord shows up, depending upon how we're able to meet him. So how this works, and when I say redeeming your timeline, you, and you guys know the scripture, it's in, it's in Ephesians, and it says, it says redeeming your time because the days are evil. And the word, the word evil means dangerous. Mm -hmm. That's actually what it means. That we must bring redemption into every time frame because it's dangerous if you don't. Mm. Okay, it's it's actually dangerous. It's it causes so much collateral damage when redemption is not in there. So the issue is not if somebody died because you can't go back and change that. I, I maybe you can, but I don't know how you can do that. Or mm -hmm. or the issue is not okay. Like we like we deal with all these molested children. Okay, the issue is not that that child was not molested. The issue is can Jesus be made manifest in it and redeem it? Mm. because then it changes. It literally changes the flow of time from something that is a curse to something that is a blessing. Wow. To something that put you off kilter to something that put you on track, because that's what redemption does. It changes. Redemption is the greatest game changer ever. And the only place redemption can work is in a flow of time. The, the reason why time began is because when Adam sinned and he fell into sin and death, he literally fell into time as well. Mm. And boom, he had never been subject to time and space and matter before. And now he was. I'm like, oh, no, man, this feels terrible. And then he died uh, 930 years later. A day is to the Lord is a thousand years. He died in that first day as the Lord promised him. And that was also part of the deception of the serpent. The serpent told Eve, you will not die. She bit into it. Dude, she didn't die. And she went to Adam and said, see, we can't really trust everything that God does, Adam. He says, no, we can, dude. No, look, I ate this and I'm still alive. And he said, give me that. And he ate it. But he fell into a timeline where he was subject to death. And of course, they didn't understand any of that. 
And they fell into it. Boom, the clock began to tick. And he had 930 years now. 930 years to begin the transformation promise to where everything is against me and I'm losing everything to now everything is for me and I'm gaining everything. Hmm. Okay? So in a non-redeemed flow of time, you're losing everything. I mean, John, you're, you're, you're losing absolutely everything. The, I, I studied the, the, the words, the last words of famous people and the last words of Frank Sinatra, who I love. I, I love Frank Sinatra, but the last, and I'm not saying that he wasn't saved. I'm just saying he was experiencing a non-redeemed flow of time, as we all do. The last, his last words was, I'm losing it. I'm losing it. I'm losing it. And he died. Well, that's mm. what you experience in a non-redeemed flow of time. You lose everything. But in a redeemed flow of time, you gain everything. Even, even Paul said, dude, for me to die is gain. There's no way I cannot gain everything because I'm redeemed and I'm experiencing redemption from everything. Okay. So if I, if I ask it, if, if I, if I'm talking to a 22, if I'm talking to a 22 year old girl and if at 16, she had been a prostitute for say seven years and unimaginable horror had happened to her instead of blocking that out, which is the human defense mechanism. And you actually just carry all of that baggage. What mm -hmm. you do is you say, no, let's invite Jesus into all of that. Now, I, I want to just tell you, when I say we're inviting him in, we're not inviting him in as a metaphor. We're inviting his presence into that place the way that you and I believe we can invite his manifest presence into our time frame right now. I mean, you're up in Pennsylvania right now. I'm down in, in north central Texas. But we don't think that there's any issue with the distance of space. No. Okay, why would we think there's any issue with the distance of time? It's in perfect continuum. Mm. So even though even though the Lord was not there, we can invite him to be there, and he shows up. For us, it's past, but for him, it matters nothing because he can step onto the train anywhere he wants to. Yeah. And then as soon yeah. as he gets on, as soon as he gets into that time frame, we become, we experience that terrible moment no longer from the atrocity that was taking place but from the redemption of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords being made manifest in that place, which means every form of bondage that that moment put me in is gone. And now every way that he set me up is here and it changes my now. Hmm. And then I begin to actually remember he was there. I never actually thought about it before, but dude, now, now I remember he was there and you suddenly begin to find him in the old Testament Mm. And you never knew he was there and he was there because you asked him to be there and it changes your right now. Wow. So if I could ask, how has God shown you this in your own personal life? What are, what's something that you've had to address in the past and say, where was God in that? Well, dude, there's so much redemption needed in this knucklehead's life. <laughs> I'm telling you full blown redemption, not only, not only in terrible things that have happened to me, but in terrible things that I have done myself, in beds I have created. Mm. And do you remember Brother David said, even if I make my bed in hell, there you are. Okay? It's one thing to invite the presence of the Lord to be into a place where you're shamefully being defeated. And that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of guts. You have to really be able to trust the Lord. It's another thing to invite Jesus into your past where you were being horrible to somebody else. Mm. Okay. And say, Lord, please show up and save those people from, from what I did. Wow. That's a whole other thing. And he will. Hmm. He will. Even if you make your bed in hell, he will show up there. And once he does, it changes absolutely everything. So I've got some really cool stories. You want to hear a couple of Absolutely. Cool yeah, yeah. Okay. So one of my favorite ones is, I, I and I have... As, as more and more people are reading this book and getting these materials and whatnot, they're starting to contact me and go, you're not going to believe what has happened. I'm like, well, I, I probably will. <laughs> I, I had a, just, just on Saturday, we met with a whole lot of people, and uh, they were given all these testimonies of redeeming their time. And one, this lady said, this lady gave this crazy cool testimony. She said, I have a cousin who has been an atheist his entire life. He is 60 some odd years old. He hates God. He wants nothing to do with God. All he does is criticize me. And I got with him and just said, why don't you believe in the Lord? 
And he said, I'll tell you why. Because when I went to Vietnam, this happened, that happened, that happened, and God wasn't there. And she said, I'm going to invite Jesus to be there. And I'm going to ask God to make you remember he was there. And she said, I'm going to, and he's like, whatever, hocus pocus, whatever. And she did that. So she goes to this family reunion like a year later. She doesn't talk to him because he's so competitive. And she goes to this family reunion a year later. And uh, this was two weeks ago. And she says, how have you been? And he says, well, I'm doing well. And she said, man, I've had a tough year. And he says, I know I've been, I've been praying for you. And she said, you've been praying for me. And he said, yeah, I've been, I've been praying for you. And she said, what have you been, who have you been praying to? And he goes, I've been praying to Jesus. What do you mean? Who have I been praying to? And she said, no, no, you don't pray to Jesus. And he said, I've always prayed to Jesus. I love Jesus. And he gave her a testimony of how the Lord had showed up to him in Vietnam and how he's been a prayer freak all these years. She has a completely different memory of a different timeline of this guy than this guy does. No way. That's so I, awesome. I just, this, this happened just this weekend. That's awesome. And she's like, yeah, he said, yeah, man, I've been praying all these years, man. I, I love God. And she said, Troy, I just sit there. And she said, I told my husband, okay, am I crazy or do I not have a 40-year history of this guy being combative, of believing anything that of, of faith? He said, honey, I don't know what to say about what this guy just said. It's like he has a different head. Mm. And she said, well, we asked the Lord to redeem his time. Mm. And it's like, what? Okay, here's something else that's crazy. <laughs> okay, I know this. I know, I know it's not. I love it. And I know I'm going to get so much hate mail, and I know people are going to think I'm an idiot. And I'm just telling you, man, Jesus is real, and he's not subject to time. I love telling it. You. I love it. So uh, this guy goes to prison for 20-some-odd years. He comes to my church. We have a huge redemption thing for prisoners. I love redemption. And it's a, it's a strange thing, John, because we prosecute sexual traffickers. We actually sent 41 guys to prison last year, and I'm, I'm responsible for sending them to prison, and I love it. Wow. I also love, uh, I paid for the lawyers. I paid for everything. I'm like, no, 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 no. You do not get to live in a world with children in it. You go to jail. Bye. I will throw you under the prison. And I have no problem with that. Then once you're in, I'm going to share Jesus with you. I'm going to support your family if you have a family. Because there's no reason for those people to starve to death right. because, you know, you're, you're a child molester. And I'm going to hope and pray in the name of King Jesus that God will change you from the wrong team to the right team. Mm. Meanwhile, I'm going to work with all of your victims and believe that God Almighty is going to bring redemption in every single part of their life. And that, that's very confusing for a lot of people. It, it's just not for me. I, I don't know why it's not. I just, I just get it. So it's okay. So I don't mind being both the sheriff and I also do not mind being the nurse. I don't mind either one. It doesn't matter to me. So with that said, this guy gets out of prison and dude, this guy been bad. And I'm talking about what he did was so bad. It wasn't sexual. But, oh, God, he was bad. He was a holy terror back in the day. And he, he robbed people and terrorized people and just destroyed people's lives and thought it was awesome that he could get away with it until he got caught and then he went to prison. While he was in prison, he had he, his entire – he didn't have one spot on his face, John, that didn't have a tattoo on it. Mm. Not one spot because he's like, I'll be in there for the rest of my life. I'll die in prison. So it doesn't matter. I mean, even his – he had, he had fingerprint tattoos on his fingerprints. There's no part of his body that didn't have ink on it. And it was horrible. Oh, my gosh. I'm talking about next level horrible. Then the dude gets saved. Saved. Filled with the Holy Ghost. God I loves falls in love with Jesus. Has a cool encounter with Jesus in solitary confinement. Lives with Jesus for, you know, a dozen years or so. And God does a miracle and gets him out of prison. And so he gets out. He comes to Open Door Church. Uh, we start taking care of him. He goes through a halfway house, all this stuff. So a year later, it's time for him to get a job, and he just is so disgusted. And he's like, dude, nobody will hire me. And I was like, well, can you blame him? Mm -hmm. Dude, you look horrible. <laughs> and God is going to have to do a miracle with you, dude. And I, was, I know you're used to this, but I've been around you for a year, and I'm still not used to it. I mean, I'm next level ugly, but that is <laughs> that's something else. And, you know, and we're like that. And he's like, well, what can I do, man? I'm like, number one, I'm going to set you up with a makeup artist for real. And you're going to learn how to wear makeup mm -hmm. so that you can get in a door. And number two, we're going to ask the Lord to redeem your time. Instead of people seeing you as a prisoner and seeing you as a felon and seeing you as a people that just terrorized Fort Worth, Texas and did horrible things, actually see you as a man of God. We need to do that.
And so the first thing that he did was he, because he'd been doing this whole thing about inviting Jesus into every single part of his life, not the omnipresence of God, but the on me presence of God. The on me presence of God. I like that. And not that God is everywhere. Yeah, he's there, but he's got to be made manifest. He has to be made manifest in order to trans, in order to transform that, that thing that he's made manifest into. And so, by the way, I stole that term from Dan McCollum. He's a good friend of mine. I don't know if you know who Dan is, but that's a, that's a Dan McCollum term. So he says, well, I need to invite the Lord into the moment that I was doing this act of terror. And it was a legit act of terror that involved a lot of people. And I heard that man pray, and I led him through this prayer. Lord Jesus, be made manifest in that moment to those people that I'm terrorizing and save them Mm. from my anger. Mm. Save them from my selfishness. Lord Jesus, visit them and give them a grace for that moment that I was doing that to those people. That's a pretty bold prayer. That's pretty, that is a pretty, um, that's a brave prayer. And he did. Then after that, I asked him, I I said, John, I I said, what is your, what is the worst moment of you going to prison? What is that? And he said, no, it wasn't going to prison. He said, it was bad, but it was the moment that, that judgment day, Mm. the day that I got sentenced. And I said, tell me about that. And he said, the moment that that judge slammed his hammer, the gavel down, he said, I knew that I was going to be everything that my dad had ever said I was going to be. And it was all bad. I knew that uh, every bad thing, every bad prophecy that every teacher had ever spoken over me was going to come true. I, I knew, I looked over at my wife, I knew a week from now, she'll be shacked up with my, with my best friend, and I'll never be married to her again. I looked at my kids and went, no one is going to raise my children. And he said, it was the most horrible, terrible thing you could possibly imagine. He said it was so, he goes, it was so unreal. He goes, it's hard to describe. And I said, bro, let's ask Jesus to be made manifest in that moment, 20, however many years ago. And he said, okay. And we asked the Lord and we invited Jesus into that courtroom. We prayed that he would be made manifest. We prayed that instead of shame, that there would be honor somehow, instead of horror, that there would be confidence we, we ask the Lord to be made manifest in a ton of different ways and say, Jesus, just wrap your arms around my brother in that moment and love him and help him and really show up in that courtroom. And you could say, well, I was there and he didn't show up. Well, he didn't show up then, but he's showing up now back then. So we did that. That was on Sunday night. Next morning, brother gets up, thinks of a place he, he can go put in an application, walks six miles to this place. Oh, wow. Gets there, starts filling out, out an application. A guy walks through the door and says, are you a welder? And he said, yeah. And he looks at him and he goes, Phew. He goes, that's okay. You can just wear a hood on your face. It's all good. I don't care. As long as you weld, let's go. Takes him back there to the welding shop and says, weld this. Does it. He says, weld that. Does it. Weld this. Boom. He says, okay, dude, I'm going to hire you on the spot, except for this. Uh, I know that you've been in prison. What? What was the nature of your crime? He told him. He goes, Okay. Uh, well, since we weld armor trucks, Mm -hmm. that's probably not going to work. Okay. And he said, yeah, he said, well, he said, I I don't, I don't think that my boss is going to let me hire you. And he said, the guy that owns the company is probably not going to let me. And he goes, I'm going to run a make on you. He said, dad gum it. And he said, okay, I understand. He said, well, just continue filling this out. I'm going to run the make on you. He sends it through to the state of Texas. It comes, it bounces back and says, there's no record of him being in prison. And he had been in prison for how many years? I want to say it's either 22, 24, or 26 years. I honestly do not remember. If you're in prison that long, you should definitely have a record that you've been in some place for that year, for that many years. Yeah. He tells him, no, man, there's a mistake. Yeah. You got to run it through again. I, I, I promise you I was in prison. And he says, okay, runs it through again. And he comes back and says, what prison were you in? And who is your probation officer? He says, well, my probation officer is this guy. This is where you contact him. And this was a prison I was in. He contacted the probation officer and the probation officer had been moved and they had a new probation officer that was in there and said, well, I'm actually taking over all this guy's stuff. And I don't know who this guy is yet. Let me run a make on him here. I'll send you his record. And he says, I'm having trouble finding his record. He said, I can't find his record either. The guy comes back in there and says, dude, we've done our due diligence and we're hiring you on the spot. Mm. And they hired him. We're talking about in 20, in less than 24 hours, John, of us asking Jesus to be made manifest in his past time frame. It removed the curse to where he could not get a job and he could not prosper in this time frame. And he got a job. And that brother went from abject poverty to upper middle class in one day. It wasn't just a, a, a $10 an hour job. It was like a $70 or $80 an hour job. Wow. wow. And his life changed instantly in one day. Boom. 
All right. So, Troy, as you're just talking <laughs> about that story, I'm blown away. Uh, I, I appreciate that you've given me some more details than what I've heard at some other places where you've talked about that story. But as you're talking about this whole judgment, this whole, you know, the judge giving his his decree, his and sentencing this guy to prison. But Jesus was able to step in and change change the results of where we are right now and how God redeemed that timeline. You know, in, in my church, whenever we talk about somebody that wants to make a decision to follow Jesus Christ, we use this phrase. We ask Jesus to become the forgiver of our past and the leader into our future. And I feel like it would be a huge disservice right now if I didn't give you the opportunity to speak to somebody who might be facing their judgment day right now. And this could be that moment where Jesus forgives their past and leads them into their future. Would you just please lead somebody right now in what that in in that most important decision right now? I don't want to miss this opportunity. So would you just please take the reins with that one? Thank you, my friend. Yeah, I just want to just speak to whoever it, whoever that is that's watching right now. And you're sitting there with your mouth open going, really? Yeah, really. I want to just tell you this, that Jesus loves you and he does not hate your humanity. He doesn't come in to actually remove you from your humanity. He comes in to remove the curse that is within your humanity, the thing that separates you from him. And he loves your humanity. And he doesn't care if you're black or white, male or female, if you're rich or poor, if you're a Southern boy like me, if you are a Northern boy like John, he doesn't care. He loves who you are and where you're from. And he knows that you desperately need to be saved in every way a person can be saved. He also knows this. The only way that he can bring that redemption to you is if you have a yes in your spirit to receive that. And all you have to do to have a yes within your spirit is just to admit that you're not God, and he is, and that you're in desperate need of a Savior. And you can figure out all that theology later on. That's not the important thing. The important thing is that you understand that Jesus sees you, he knows you, he loves you, and you can literally invite him into your life to change your life in every way that you can be changed. There's going to come a time in your life that you just have to decide. It doesn't work for me to be screwed up like this anymore. It doesn't work for me to be sad. It doesn't work for me to be hopeless. It doesn't work for me to be mad and angry. It doesn't work. It doesn't work for me to be addicted. It doesn't work for the world to own me anymore. And you don't have to live like that. Jesus is your redeemer. So here's what I want you to do. If you're watching and if this is real for you, I want you to say this prayer with me. I want you to say, King Jesus, come into my heart. Help me. Forgive me. Love me. Change me. Show up in my life right here, right now. I need you, Lord, to be so real to me. In Jesus' name, amen. If, if, if you're praying that prayer, and just stumbling through that. I want to tell you, it's not about saying magic words. It's not about that. It's about being real. It's about being sincere. And now it's about this. Just begin to thank him. Just begin to just say, thank you, Jesus. And just, and just begin to just worship him. Like, well, I don't know how to worship him. Just begin to tell, just begin to tell him how grateful you are. The word worship comes from worth ship. Like, okay, I have a worth for this. This is a big deal to me. Make a big deal out of the presence of King Jesus. And then I want you to find somebody. I want you to, I don't know how you contact my brother right here. Contact him and tell him, dude, I just gave my heart to King Jesus. And do that. You got to tell somebody. Absolutely. That is so important. Taking that next step because it's, you know, the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that, that yes. you know, Jesus died yes. for our sins and God raised him from the yes. dead, then you yes. shall be saved. But you got to confess it with your mouth. You got to tell somebody. You got to be bold about that. You know, you can't yep. just keep this thing to yourself because if you do, then it's like hiding it under a bushel and you're not going to let that light shine. But yeah, so please reach out to me. I'll put all the information of how you can do that in the show notes here. And as well as all of Troy's information, as well as website, the book, uh, the church, uh, the ministries that he has, everything, anything that he wants to put in there. But yeah, I just did not want to let that moment pass. I'm, because, I'm glad you did that, man. That's cool. Because time is so important and time yeah. is of the essence. You know, we can't yeah. say that, you know, I'll just do it later. I'll just do it later because you don't know that's right. when now. that's going to be. And so today is it, the day of salvation. Exactly. Right exactly. And we don't want to be facing that judge knowing 
that that heavenly judge knowing what we've done in the past is going to separate us from him. And so if you made that decision and you prayed with, with uh, Pastor Troy, please get in, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll help you with that next step too. And Troy, as we're wrapping up here, I'm enjoying this conversation so, so much. I appreciate all Let's of this. Let's do it again, man. We yeah. need to do it again. Yeah. There's definitely more things that I want to talk about, but I do need to ask a couple questions just to complete this this episode you know the whole thing of this podcast is along the way and like the disciples were walking with jesus but had no clue that it was him until they sit down at the table jesus blesses the food and breaks the bread and poof he's gone and they turn to each other and said weren't our hearts burning within us along the way as he was revealing the scriptures to us so troy where in your life as you look back where do you realize that jesus was burning in your heart but you didn't realize it at that moment because I want to learn from that so that I don't miss it moving forward. Oh, it's so good, man. I, I love that question. I don't think I've ever had anybody ask me that question. And it's actually a real big part of my life. I I, I am always, I love the whole thing about, Lord, that was you. And I didn't know it was you. I, I didn't have a clue that that was you. You know, the Bible says in Romans 1 that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, even his eternal power and Godhead are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made so that they are without excuse. It literally means you can literally see the deep spiritual things of God through the everyday things going on around you, right? I can tell you that uh, one, of the coolest, one of the coolest experiences that I've ever had of that outside of just the common experiences is I was in, uh, I was also, this was in Costa Rica, and we went up the Serapaki River, and we went to, we were preaching to indigenous people all throughout the jungle and in the mountains up there. And I got extremely sick. I actually got something that's called dengue fever, mm. and uh, it's bad. <laughs> I mean, it is next level bad. You get a bad fever, your eyes bleed. Yeah, okay. Mm. And that's not a good day. No, definitely not. Anyway, I was, um, I, I got bad sick. My missions team went on to the next village. I just said, look, you're too sick. You can't travel. You just got to stay here. We're going to go on to the next village. We'll be back in five days. And I'm like, yeah, just leave me here. I'm done. And I got sicker and sicker and I got so sick and nobody there spoke English. I got so sick that, um, literally that they, they decided I was going to die and they sent word to the next village, which it took a day to walk there to tell them that dude died because they knew that by the time that they'd get back that I was going to be dead. I was in bed and I was at, I was, and it wasn't even a house. It was just a, anyway, I, it wasn't a real bed. And I'd been laying there, hadn't spoke a word of English to anybody in five days. And I was sick unto death and I was going to die. And all of a sudden what I thought was one of those missionaries came into the room and he sat down on my bed and he said, man, Troy. And he put his, he put his hand on my forehead and he said, you are extremely sick. You've never been this sick in your whole life. And I said, no, I've never been this sick before. And he tells me this, he says, I've got good news. And the good news is tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to feel a whole lot better. And the day after tomorrow, you're going to be strong enough to walk out of this place. And I was just laying there, never looking at him one time. And I said, Oh, you think so? He said, I know so. And you need to believe that. And I said, I, I believe it. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to, I honestly am like, I told him, and I start saying, yeah, I've been thinking I'm going to die in this place. And I've been thinking they're going to bury me right over there. And my wife and my kids are going to track out here to the jungle and see the place where the old man is buried at. And I've been thinking about all that. And he said, no, no, that's not going to happen. Um, you will, you're going to, you're going to feel better tomorrow and you're going to walk out of here the next day. You got to believe that. And then that's what I said, okay, I believe it. And then he changed the conversation and he said, look at how far you've come, Troy. Look at you. He goes, you're not that kid running around barefoot in the, in the, in the back pasture, running around cows, you know, all the way from Joshua, Texas, look at how far you come. And he started telling me, man, you're going to go a whole lot farther. And I was like, I was like, you think so? He's like, I know so. I, I know that you are. He, and he wasn't like, oh, no, you're so sick. He was like, Dude, you're sick. <laughs> he was like, man, but you're going to go a whole lot further than this. You really are. And so he started praying for me. And he started saying, Father, thank you for Troy. I'm going to start crying, man. Mm. He, said, he started saying, Father, thank you for Troy. Thank you for him. And thank you for his journey. Thank you for who he is. And he just started saying all this. I'm just like, yes, Lord, I was so sick. The next morning... I started waking up and there was some excitement in the village and this kid came in there and he was talking in Spanish and he was like, you know, your amigos, your amigos, your friends are here. And my friends came in 
And they were like, dude, we heard you were dead. And I was like, no, I'm not dead. I was like, I'm, I'm actually, I actually feel better. Look, I don't have a fever. And I was sitting up and they're like, when we heard you died, man. He goes, we were coming back here to bury you. Mm. And I said, yeah, I, I had that on my radar that that was going to happen. But thanks God, you know, praise the Lord for you guys showing up here last night and praying for me, man. And talking to me all night, man, you nailed it, man. I got through the night and they're like, well, wasn't none of us here last night. And I said, yeah, yeah. One of you guys came back here last night and you sat on the bed and talked to me for like an hour. Who, who was that? It's the first time I heard English all week. He goes, no, it wasn't any of us. And I'm like, seriously, seriously, I'm not, I'm not, it wasn't like a vision. Somebody was sitting here and put his hands on me and prayed for me and talked to me. I was like, I thought it was one of you guys. And they're like, no, man, that's Jesus. He shows up like that all the time. And I was like, what? <laughs> and you know what? I thought of that scripture, brother, that you said that your that your show was because there was no there was no stained glass. Wow. There was no angels in the room. There was no trumpets. Da, da, da. He was so casual with how he dealt with me. I didn't recognize it was Jesus. And mm. once they said that, I went, ah, I should have known it was Jesus. Didn't my heart burn within me? I should have known that was him. It never occurred to me that was him because, because he related to my humanity in such a crazy cool way that I, he was like, dude, you're sick. Wow. That's next level sick. And like, what have you been thinking about? And I told him, I've been thinking about, they're going to bury me right out there. They didn't have a door on this building and I could see out and I could see that there was another grave out there. And I said, they're going to bury me right there. My wife and kids are going to come out here and say, he goes, no, that's not going to happen. I got good news. Tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and you're going to feel better. Next day you're going to walk out. And in and, and that moment, man, when my friends arrived, I knew that Jesus had been with me in a manifest, tangible way. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So just to kind of cooperate with that, just to kind of cooperate with that, by the way, I got, I got healed and I, I wasn't, I didn't have the strength to leave the next day, but I did leave the day after. It was just as the Lord told me, but you know what I've done since then, just to kind of be psychotic. I've thought about that moment when I was sick and I was going to die. And I've asked the Lord to go back in time and be with me on that night, knowing that he did. Mm. So knowing, I believe that God showed up. Jesus did that knowing that in the future, I was going to pray that. <laughs> okay. Are you with me? Oh, I'm with you. I think it's just something hilarious between me and God. That's what I think. Oh, wow. I'm so glad you shared that story. I, I got one more big question that I normally ask. If you yourself could go, could literally go back in time and talk to your younger self, whether it be a teenager, 20s, 30s, whatever it might be, and just give yourself some advice, what is it that you would tell yourself? Wow. Do you, do you seriously ask people that usually? Yes, I do. Man, that is so wise. Well, for one thing, I'd go way past myself, and I would take a bunch of automatic weapons to the Alamo. <laughs> That'd be one of the first things I'd do. I would also go back to November 22nd, 1963 and see who was on the grassy you knoll. I would do that. <laughs> I would love to go back to August 21st to 70 AD and see Vesuvius go off. There's all kinds of things I would love to see because I think about time travel a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. But if I could go back and talk to the young version of me, oh, my, what a conversation we would have because that brother has no idea who he is. Mm -hmm. He has no idea his potential. He has no idea of what he's capable of. He has no idea that he can learn things, that he's a gifted learner. Um, he has no idea. And I would literally tell him, dude, you don't know this, but you're a business guy. You're a guy that God can trust with millions and millions of dollars. I have a whole bunch of businesses now. And I mean, I didn't start any of those until, until after I was 50. Hmm. I would literally speak identity into him. And I would say this, do not believe anything anybody has ever told you about you and believe what Jesus tells you about him and constantly go to him and say, who are you to me and who am I to you? And so live good. that life. So good. That's what I tell him. That is so good. I've greatly enjoyed this conversation. We got to get together <laughs> again. But how can people get a hold of you right now? How can, how can they get Redeeming Your Timeline, the book? How can they find you online? Tell everybody that's listening how they can get a hold of you. Well, there's two different really cool ways. One is just go to troybrewer.com and I you can find everything that we offer at troybrewer.com. And then I have something else too that I offer that's kind of unique to us, man, and that I have a 24 hour a day calling center and it's mostly widows that I've set up to do that. And all they do is pray with people and hook people up to everything that we're doing. 
I, I love it. It's one of my favorite ministries that I have. And it's it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's totally free. If you need prayer, if you need resources, if you want information about anything about me, just call 877-413-0888. 877-413-0888. And then they can find me, troybrewer.com or call the calling center. Yeah, I will be putting all his information in the show notes so you can you can just go down to that and click on those links there and that'll be easy for you but yeah Troy this has been a phenomenal conversation I feel so much closer to Jesus because of talking with you and my heart is burning and I'm glad that I'm paying attention to that so I want to thank you for allowing me to join you along your way keep on doing what you're doing brother proud of you man I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Troy Brewer I was blessed going through the conversation a second time. And if you want to get the benefit of what all Troy and I talked about, then I suggest listening to it again as well. I hope that I can get Troy back on again sometime soon to talk more. There is so much more that we can learn from him. And I'm grateful that he was able to give his time to have this conversation with me. If you want to know more about Troy and his amazing ministries, I'll be providing his information in the show notes. Thank you for listening to Along the Way. If you've enjoyed joining me along my way, please share this episode with a friend who you think will be encouraged by this podcast. Also, please rate and review Along the Way on iTunes. That helps more people discover Along the Way. And subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and at my website, alongtheway.media. I hope that you've enjoyed this part of my journey. And may you realize when Jesus is walking with you along your way. Along the Way is honored to be part of the Charisma Podcast Network. You can find tons of spirit-filled content from their vast catalog of podcasts, including my Monday through Friday news stories for the Charisma News Podcast. Go to cpnshows.com to see the full list and latest episodes.